good to be in the house of the Lord. Today, we've uh, come to the final two sermons in our series entitled Authentic Christianity. We've been going through the Beatitudes, and now we want to get to the, uh, uh, to the what do we do with this portion of the Beatitudes. So if you would uh, turn to Matthew 5, verse 13, and stand for the reading of the word, we will go there. Stand if you are able. Matthew 5, 13. 5, 13. Reading of the word says, You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word today. We thank you for the great things you have done, the great things you are doing in our congregation. Father, we pray that this word gets down deep in our heart, in our mind, in our spirit. And Father, that we would uh, be obedient to your word and excited to follow you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So in the Beatitudes, Jesus taught about the character of an authentic Christian. We walked through Jesus' teaching on what a true Christian overflowing with Jesus looks like. We saw Jesus teaching truths that were shocking and not anything similar to what his original audience wanted to do, uh, wanted or thought they would hear from Jesus. We noticed the tension between what they grew up believing and what the world said was a happy or a blessed life and what Jesus said is a happy or a blessed life. It all started, if you remember, with being poor in spirit and recognizing that on our own we are nothing without God and that we are spiritually bankrupt. And then, if you remember a couple weeks ago, it ended with the improbable blessing of persecution and the great reward that is in store for us. We saw what a Christian truly is through the Beatitudes, but here, as we progress in, in the following verses, we see how a Christian should live out their Christian life in the world we live. Now in verse 13 here that we just read, we get to see the function of individual Christians that make up the church. Yet similar to most of Jesus' teaching, there was an interesting dichotomy that exists because as Christians, yes, we've been transferred out of the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of the marvelous light, but we're still here. We are in the world, but not of the world. We are separate from the world, but we are not to live in isolation from the world. We are elect exiles. We are a chosen generation. We are pilgrims. We are strangers. We are aliens, but we're still here. We're still here in this world as much as we were when we were walking in darkness. We are the uh, ecclesia, the Greek word for the church. The Greek word for the church uh, is that we are called out. We are a called out generation. We have not been raptured and we have not gone on to heaven yet. So what is the reason for us being here? We are still here in the flesh. What is the reason that we wake up every morning and go to work and interact with people? Why do we go through this seemingly mundane life of paying bills and going shopping and going to school? Well, according to Jesus, we are still here because we have been chosen to be a part of his plan to bless the rest of the world. We have been called to be a blessing, and we engage in Great Commission ministry, but also we are called to go around doing good works. As Christians, God doesn't immediately rapture us out of this world because he wants us to be a blessing to the world, even as we yearn for the promised land that is to come. God has called us to be his mouthpiece and his hands and feet in a world that is dying without 
Jesus. And Jesus is saying specifically in the Beatitudes here, here is authentic Christianity. Here is the blessed life that I give you out of my grace. And that's what verses 3 through 12 were telling us. But this is what I want you to do with this blessed life in verses 13. Along with the fellowship of your brothers and sisters that make up the church, I want you, number one, point number one today, to be a salty church. He says, I want you to be salty. I want you to be a, a salty church. Not salty as in the way that you are annoying or, or kind of mean to somebody. No, that's not what we're talking about this morning. He says, I want you to be a salty church. Well, why did Jesus compare us with a common commodity that was and is very difficult to live without? Why an everyday item such as salt to explain our role in our relationship with the world we live in. Why did he use salt? Well, he used salt because Jesus is making it very clear that the world is rotten, that the world is polluted, that the world is foul, that the world is wasting away, and that the world is offensive to God in its unregenerate fallen state. The world follows the prince of the power of the air, which is Satan. The world is sinful, and left alone, the world leans towards Chaos, And according to Romans chapter 8, whole, the whole of creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until, until now. The world is dying. All of creation is leaning towards chaos. We know this because we can see the decay before our very eyes. If, for example, there was a show on the History Channel a couple years ago. And this show uh, told us it had got these scientists and these engineers together, and they did a show, a series, on what would happen to uh, various places, various cities, New York City in particular, if people vanished from the earth. And what they said was that only after a few years, decay, uh, without human beings maintaining the buildings, decay would set in. And they went through the timeline of New York City without humans, and they went through 20 years, and 50 years, and 150 years, and with each passing year, the dec decay progressed. Until 200 years, they said that even the high-rise buildings would collapse and the scene would be overwhelmed with chaos and it would look something like Jurassic Park. And that's uh, only 200 years in New York City. Family, it's the same with humanity. God originally created everything good, and he said that it was good, and then he created human beings in his image, and he said that we are good and very good, but as we know, sin entered the earth. Sin entered the picture, and when sin is full grown, it brings forth death. The only hope in this world that we have, and all of creation has, that leans towards chaos is Jesus Christ. And it last week's service by encouraging you that because Jesus is alive, we have a hope that never ends. But this hope that we have can't be kept to ourselves. It can't be kept to ourselves. Jesus made it clear that the world is similar to meat that was spoiling out in the summer's heat. And as quickly as meat rots in the summer's heat, there has to be a contrasting and a different force that comes in and slows down the process. Family Christians are that contrasting and different force, empowered by the Holy Spirit, sent to slow down the process of a decaying world. Christians are supposed to be as different as the, to the world as much as, as salt is different than the meat we put on to preserve it. And we should be ecstatic that we are different from the world. Being different from the world is something that should uh, be exciting in our life and we should be filled with joy because being different than the world is proof, proof positive that God has a hold on your life. We should be ecstatic that we no longer think the way we used to think. We should be ecstatic about the growth of, of being in Christ and Christ being in us and that we no longer think the way we used to think. We should be ecstatic and overflowing with joy that, that we don't live the same way we used to live. We should take a look at our life and notice the miracle 
of a change of heart, the miracle of a change in mind, the miracle of, a, of, of what you were once walking in darkness, but now you are walking in light. For example, there is this one dear sister that I ministered to for many years in California, and she had lived a very hard life of drugs and alcohol and abuse. And when uh, she was saved, uh, dramatically saved by, by God, uh, she couldn't even walk. Uh, heroin had taken uh, a toll on her body. But then she got saved, and she started growing in the world, and she was different. And then every Sunday she would come up to me, and she would say, hey, 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 it's been six months since I haven't had a drink. And then she came up to me and said, it's been 10 months until, uh, since I haven't drink alcohol. And everything wasn't perfect in her life. She was, she was learning to walk again. And she was regaining her strength. And everything wasn't perfect, but she was so excited because she said, I'm different. I'm different. I'm different. Uh, my body's different. My mind's different. And then a remarkable thing. She, she once said to me, she said, I gave up the heroin. I gave up the alcohol. She was like, but I don't think... Um, uh, I'll ever be able to stop smoking. And one Sunday she came up and she says, you know what? If God took heroin out of my life, if God took alcohol out of my life, then God can take cigarettes and nicotine out of my life. And she, she, she committed herself to the Lord and, and she was all along this process. And, and she came up and she said, okay, it's been one week. It's been one week. Uh, it's not a long time, but it's been one week, and she was so excited, and then she came up to me and said, it's been a month, it's been a month, and then she came up to me one day, and she said, oh, I slipped up a little bit, I slipped up a little bit, and I said, ah, you know, keep going, keep going, she said, you know what, I slipped up, but I, 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 I don't feel too upset about that, because look how different I am. She was different than the world. She was different than what she had be. And she was excited. It wasn't that she was perfect. It wasn't that, that everything was going to be perfect, but she was different. And that's a miracle, to be different than the world. Family, it should be so obvious that we are different than the world. We should be like an alien. Obvious is that we don't belong here. Obvious that we have this dual citizenship. Obvious that we are headed for a new home in heaven. Not that we don't carry some baggage along with us along the way, but our destination is different than the world. So why does Jesus say we should be salt? He calls us salt because simply the world is wasting away and because salt is different than what it's applied to. And then salt preserves and adds flavor to anything it's applied to. Salt preserves and then adds flavor to anything it's applied to. We are called to prevent the world from going completely bad by preserving the truth of God in a world that is deceived into believing lies. And as the media and as the indoctrination of false and ungodly lies attempts to flood our hearts and our minds, Christians are the people who have been called and placed here on the earth to preserve godliness and godly truth in an un godly society. We should preserve the world by providing some type of hope and, and, and some type of integrity. We have the power of, uh, through the Holy Spirit to provide a godly example to those around us. Again, this is not about being perfect. This is not about being stuck up, but it is about standing on the word of God in a world living out lies. The thing about this, I say we need to be a salty church, but this can't just be a church thing. It has to be an individual Christian thing where Christian things where godliness is preserved. A new way of life is explained out there in a daily basis. The thing about it is I don't believe the church is supposed to be deeply involved in politics. But I'm sure wish we had some true Bible-believing Christians deeply involved in politics. The church's job is to preach the gospel to all people and to all places. But the individual Christian can go to places the whole church can't go to. For instance, the local church, we can't gather 
and get into the White House. Uh, they would never allow that. We can't go into the governor's mansion as a church and preach the gospel. We can't do that, but uh, an individual Christian can An individual Christian may be working as a mail clerk, and that one mail clerk can uh, uh, be salt to those around us and one by one win other people to Jesus Christ by being an effective witness, by being different, by preserving godliness. And what would happen? What would happen if one Christian, one Christian filled with the Holy Spirit who maybe even have a a simple job as a janitor in the White House would go around uh, spreading salt and preserving truth and, and, and being a light to a dark world? What would happen if even one Christian started winning other Christians to Jesus? in the White House. And what if it spread? And what if a revival happened? Well, sooner or later, sooner or later, the, the, the place would be better. That maybe uh, uh, such ungodliness wouldn't come out of the political realm. I read a story once about one Christian business owner that was in the inner city, and, and, and there was multiple businesses in his block, and, and he decided, you know what, I just want to be salt to those people around me. And so he started up a Bible study, and pretty soon a couple other business owners started attending the Bible study, and a couple of them got saved, and a couple of them were already Christians, and he started discipling them. He started uh, pouring out his life into them and investing them, and before you know it, uh, the uh, whole group there were Christian business owners in an inner city where drugs and violence uh, were a regular occurrence. And so what happened was they decided, you know what, I'm tired of walking, of driving around this city and this block and seeing liquor stores. And I'm tired of going down the street and seeing strip joints. And I'm tired of seeing this place full of bars. And so what they, what they did, and this is a remarkable story, but what they did is they pooled their money together, and, and they, they, they bought out the bar, <laughs> and they bought out the liquor store, and they bought out the strip joint, and they put in, in, in those uh, buildings businesses and wholesome businesses that provided jobs for the community. What were they doing? They were preserving life. They were preserving goodness and godliness and having a positive. They were flavoring their community with the love of Jesus Christ. You see, it's individuals, individual Christians who love Jesus, who make a difference in the world right where they are. You know, uh, there's never been more government intervention in the world and in our country than there is now. But is it not true that the world is wasting away at a faster clip than ever before? Family, we must be salt. Government's not going to solve the problems. Even, I love social work, but social work is not going to solve the problems. More programs is not going to solve the problems. Only true Bible-believing, born-again, blood-washed, Holy Spirit-filled Christians can stop the putrefaction, the rottenness, the evilness, and the degradation in our country. And one by one, as we live a faithful, Jesus-loving Christian life, the Holy Spirit will do its work in the hearts of people. So salt preserves what is good and adds flavor to the world, but then salt also makes us thirsty. Us thirsty. My wife will say often, there's not enough salt on (laughs) there. I joke with her, I say, well, you would put salt on salt, okay? (laughs) But salt makes us thirsty. Salt makes us thirsty. The question I have for you is, does your life make anyone thirsty for Jesus Christ? I believe God desires us to live a life that's so salty that other people are drawn to God and desire to live their life similar to you just because they see the beauty, the simple beauty of a Christian life. There is something so powerful about a Christian who lives their life with peace and lives their life with joy and lives their life with hope. And there's something so powerful about a quiet spirit that depends on God just as a baby depends on their parents. 
I know in my life, I've told you before, growing up in a, a, a broken home, in a tough environment, I yearn for the simplicity of a God-centered environment. As much as I rebelled and as much as I wanted the flashy things in life, you know what really made me thirsty for Jesus Christ? Was being around my grandparents. It was being around my grandparents. And as much as I loved the flash and I loved, as much as I was attracted and sometimes tempted by the world, what I really yearned, what I really desired was to be in a godly environment. I would encourage you this morning, if you have kids, if you have grandkids, if you have uh, adult children, and sometimes we think that uh, kids need the, the flashy things and want the expensive trips to the mall and, and want the expensive vacations, I'm going to tell you what they really want. They really want the authentic Christian life being played out before them. Does your life make anyone thirsty for Jesus Christ. So as salt, we should be different. As salt, we should preserve what is good. As a uh, salty church, we should add flavor. And then we should make other people thirsty for Jesus Christ. But here's the last point. The last point is that salt is common. Isn't it interesting that when Jesus shows an illustration to teach about salt, and how we function in this world, he used something as common as salt. J Jesus gave us a common item to compare ourselves with. He didn't say that we are the gold of the earth. He didn't say that we are the gems of the earth. He didn't use an expensive item. No, he used a common he, item. He used salt, a common everyday item. In other words, I believe Jesus was trying to tell his disciples and tell us today that Jesus is not looking for the wise. He's not looking for the powerful, and he's not looking for the important. He's not looking for the popular people to make the largest influence on a dying world. No, he said, I delight in using the little things, the common things. In fact, Paul says this. He says, for consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish of the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human might be able to boast in the presence of God. So Jesus said, no, no, I'm going to use the foolish things. I'm going to use the despised, the weak, the, those of low status. I'm going to use a humble means to accomplish the mission of redeeming a broken humanity back to the Father. In fact, he says, the more humble you are, the lower you go, the greater God is going to use you. You see, God uses ordinary things in ordinary people, in ordinary places, in ordinary everyday circumstances. And he says, you be the salt of the earth. You be the salt to people around you. Preserve some godliness in your household. Preserve some godliness in your workplace. Preserve some godliness in your community. I know that you're not the wisest. You might not be the number one draft pick, but go add flavor to the atmosphere by being full of love and full of joy and full of peace and full of hope. Make others long for what you have. Make others long to have a close walk with the Lord just as you have. He says, I'm going to use the unspectacular people to build my kingdom. I'm going to use the unspectacular so that when it's time to boast that we can only boast in what Jesus Christ did on the cross. Let's be a salty church to a dying world. But then Jesus also tells us that it's possible to lose our saltiness. He says, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? And so it's possible, family, as much as we are secure in our salvation, as much as we are God's children, it's possible to lose our saltiness. Now, how would we lose our saltiness? Well, uh, the, the disciples, the, the original audience of Jesus' teaching here would know exactly what it would mean to lose your saltiness. Because there was a type of salt in the region where they were that had lost its flavor and it's lost its saltiness. And the salt that was near the Dead Sea was a salt that was not a pure salt. It was a salt that was mixed with 
gypsum and other type of materials. And so when Jesus was using this illustration about salt losing its saltiness, he was referring to the salt near the Dead Sea. Now, why was the salt near the Dead Sea um, losing its flavor or had lost its flavor? Well, the salt near the Red Sea had been diluted. It had been diluted, and it wasn't a pure salt. So what does that tell us as Christians? What does it tell us as Christians? Uh, It tells us that we can lose our salt if we allow compromise to seep into our lives. We can lose our salt by being diluted with lies, being diluted with false beliefs. We can uh, lose our saltiness by compromising with the world. And then what use would we be? What use would we be? You know, we will never win the community by being just like the community. (laughs) We will never uh, uh, save a dying world by being just like a dying world. The power that we have is that we are so different that we make others thirsty. Family, we need to consider where we've let compromise seep in, where we've been diluted if we want to be salt to a dying world. But then there's hope. But then there's hope. So I close out this morning. You may ask the question, well, um, I don't feel very salty this morning. What, if, what do you do if you can honestly admit if you're being 100% authentic, that this moment you're not feeling very passionate about Jesus? What if you can admit that maybe you've lost some fire for Jesus in this season of life? What if you're here this morning and you could admit that you've lost your zeal for Jesus? What if you love Jesus, but you can admit this morning that maybe you're just all churched out? I know that's a dangerous thing for me to say as a pastor, but what if you're just all churched out? You ever been there? You're trying your best to serve God in the church, and you're trying your best to be a part of the church, and you're trying your best, but you're just all churched out. You're just uh, not fearing feeling very salty. What if you can be authentic with me and say, I'm just not into it right now? Well, the truth of the matter is the hope that you have is that you can be restored and that you can be reseasoned by the power of the Holy Spirit. How do I know that? I know that because Jesus told a church, a church of Ephesus in the book of Revelation, he says, I have this against you. He said, you lost your first love. And what I need you to do is come back to your first love. The Bible says that God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek his face. And then he says this. He says, uh, I stand at your door and knock. And so if you're not feeling very seasoned this morning, if you're not feeling very into it, if, if you lost a little bit of the passion that you used to have for Jesus, what are you to do to be reseasoned? Simply go back to your first love. Jesus says, I'm knocking at your door. Would you let me in? And, and then he says, if you let me in, I will dine with you. In other words, he says, I will fellowship. I will sit down with you at your table, and I will light that passion under you again. But the passion isn't going to be for church at first. The passion is going to be for Jesus Christ. Would you let him in this morning? I don't know where you're at in your life this morning. If you're on fire for Jesus, and and maybe you are in a place where you're just going around spreading salt to everyone around you, but maybe you're in a situation where you just don't feel like it. That's you. Would you return to your first love this morning? Would you simply get in the presence of God and dine with them and, 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 and sit with them? And, and, and would you simply just think about the cross? Think about what Jesus did on the cross for you. And, and as you consider the great sacrifice that Jesus made, I guarantee you before long, you'll be resalted again.
I love that old song that says, Jesus, keep me near the cross. There, a precious fountain, free to all, a healing stream flows from Calvary's mountain. If you need a healing stream this morning, I invite you to open the door for Jesus because he's knocking. For he's knocking at your door. He's knocking at your door this morning. So I want just to give you a few minutes here and spend a few minutes dining with Jesus Christ this morning. Have you lost your saltiness? If yes, it can be restored this morning. Take a few minutes and we'll close out this sermon.